Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Fleeting Thoughts, an altered TCG podcast, part of the Main Deck Podcast family. I'm Dan. And I'm Jordan. And uh, today we're going to be going over uh, a mailbag question or a series of mailbag questions. Far more than one. (laughs) Yeah, far more than one. Uh, We were going to spread them out across multiple videos for this particular individual, but they had asked so many that we thought we'd just kind of get all of them out of the way uh, in one go so they don't have to wait and you don't hear them every single episode. And it seems (laughs) like we're constantly talking about their questions. So we're like, you know what? We'll just have a dedicated episode going over all of the juicy questions. Plus, I feel like you guys will definitely want to hear the, the answers to half of these. So at, at yeah. minimum. I I we we were talking about this before we recorded, and I was like, like every we could either do this. Every episode we go, and we have another question from Shadow the Sixth every time. Or we or I just thought, you know what? Like, let's just give Shadow of the Sixth is a is actually a friend of ours who just decided to send in just a, a barrage of there's like 12 questions on here or something and there's just so many that i just thought let's just hook them up let's just go through today's episode will just be all of shadow the six mailbag questions before we do jump in and start answering all these juicy questions i have two things i want to mention uh three things technically depends on how you count it um The first one is that we are going over mailbag questions, which does mean, in case you are unaware, we do have a mailbag that is open and ready to receive your questions for future episodes. Now, future episodes will have various people's questions, not just Shadow of the Six questions, which is today only, um, until he asks more. But uh, if you want to get your questions answered, go ahead and either either leave a comment down below in the, if you're watching on YouTube, leave a comment in the comment section with hashtag mailbag in the comment and that'll let us know that you want us to answer it on a future mailbag Um, or you can go ahead and send an email to maindeckgames at gmail.com with subject line fleeting thoughts mailbag and then drop your question in there however you want to ask it is awesome Um, really appreciate you giving these questions we have a whole bunch of episodes to do before the launch of altered so having mailbag questions helps give us interesting things to chat about every episode shake things up a little bit uh, like Shadow of the Sixth is letting us do today. Um, additionally, if you enjoy what you're doing, you enjoy listening to Fleeting Thoughts, you enjoy where you're at in life right now with us playing in your ears, you can support Main Deck anytime by, of course, interacting with our videos or our podcast content. If you're on Spotify or iTunes, five-star ratings are incredibly helpful. Thank you so much. And if you're on YouTube, of course, you know what the algorithm wants. You like the video, you comment, you subscribe, you do all that stuff. All that stuff is super appreciated and will help us continue to produce more content and improve our content for you as we go. So thank you so much for your support that way. If you play other TCGs, you want to support us financially, tcgplayer.com. We have an affiliate link you can use linked in the description below, or you can type bit.ly slash shop TCGs in your URL bar. Shop for any TCGs you like there, and we get a little kickback from that at no extra cost to you. So really appreciate all the ways you support us. Thank you all so much for your support. Now, we got a lot of questions. A lot. How many are there here, actually? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We have 11. 11 questions from Shadow the Six to get through today. And Jordan, I figure that'll probably be a clean hour. Just about. Oh, for sure. For sure. And if not, I have a question for you that I could maybe pose. uh, Either (laughs) before or after. Oh, well, let's do before. Why not? Kick it off. What is your question for me? I have no idea what this is going to be. So uh, it's occurred to me that we've all had these in, a, in, in our in our card gaming career. Um, but what is the biggest card game blunder you've ever had? Like during a match where you're sitting there, you're playing, you think of your like your mind gaming, your opponent thinking of what their best option is, what your best option is. And then you do the exact opposite of what you should have done. And it was extremely obvious. And then after the fact, you're like, I'm the I'm I'm the worst card game player on the planet. How how did I even do that? I just okay. spent five minutes thinking about something. <laughs> so, our, my I I've made so many blunders that it would be difficult to look at my entire card gaming career <laughs> and pick just one. But I actually have a very very good one to share with our altered audience here that happened just this very week in altered. So this will be this will be very fun. Um, 
I have spent the past week. I'm going to let in our let our audience know because I think I don't think I'm going to get this video done this week as we're recording it. So the, our fleeting thoughts episode release a few days after we record them. We're in we're in the past right now. As you're listening to this, we're in the past. And in the past, I've been playing multiple days this week with a um, Orak and Kibble Lyra deck, which is the 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 hero that um, is every time you play a character with a zero stat, she gets a counter. And at the start at noon, you can remove five counters and flip the top card of your deck, and you can play it for free. Okay, this deck's fun. It's it's goofy, it's crazy, it's fun. And it can be tough to win with, <laughs> is what I've found. Um, and as I was recording gameplay for this, I've actually recorded... I've played more than six games. I've recorded six games so far. And I am not happy with any three, like subset of three of them in total to put on our the video I usually do for gameplay. Because... Dear audience, I specifically want to give you what you're looking for, which is you're not going to click on this video and be satisfied if at the end of the video I didn't ever flip a Shenlong or anything cool into play, because most of these games I flip a Hathor or something, <laughs> and most of these games I only get one flip off of a Rock and Kibble. I get two sometimes. Um, I've gotten I almost got three one time. I was really close to getting a third one game. Uh, but it's it's usually just one flip because, you know, they with zeros on all your stats, your defense is not very good. <laughs> so <laughs> you don't have a lot of time. It's not a game. It's not like the Gorang deck where the game can just go super late because you can just block everything off. Um, the game kind of ends. And so this is all to say my biggest blunder was I had one game where I flipped a Shenlong. OK, I actually did one. I was recording this game and I I got to a rock and kibble on five. I got a rock and kibble on five. I f went to noon. I removed five counters. I flipped Shenlong. My opponent saw the Shenlong and did the um, did the like uh, salute emote or something. They're like, you know, congratulations. You, you hit the Shenlong. I was like, yes. <laughs> and I played the Shenlong on the wrong side of the board. No. I I flipped the Shenlong. I put it into so based on where I was at, I had one side, the companion side, I was on a pure water um space. On the hero side, I was on pure mountain. I put Shenlong onto the pure water space and looked at my hand, and I had no mountain stats in my hand at all. I only had forest and water or pure water on everything. Because you have these zeros everywhere. So you just um and I then could commit nothing relevant to the other side. I think my opponent was on a mountain something space, so I couldn't block them either. Um, so Shenlong, sure, Shenlong could progress on the one side. I couldn't put anything on the other, and my opponent ended up progressing there, and they were already ahead of me. And I got so tilted by this, actually, that... I kind of sh I like I normally when I'm recording the videos, I'm commenting and I'm doing all my like normal commentary as I'm playing. I like shut down. I just like felt so embarrassed that I did that. And like I finally flipped the shed long and I put it on the wrong side that like I kind of just stopped commenting because I knew the game was just like I lost the game there and there was no way that I could flip the shed long completely epically misplay it with an obvious like there, it, it should have been very obvious which side to put this on and then post that up for you and be like, watch me have my incredible games with a rock and kibble. Um, so since then, I still haven't got another Shenlong flip. So as you're w listening to this, I I'm hopefully going to have that video up this week. But last week, I think we missed an altered video entirely because I spent the whole week trying to get one done and I just was never satisfied with it. That is that is, I don't know. I felt like that was a pretty epic misplay, Jordan. How about you? Oh man, yeah, that was uh, that was pretty bad. <laughs> um, trying to think here, um, what peeling back and because like you, like you, I've had a lot of times where I've done just the 
the worst possible play. The main reason that sparked this question is because today I was playing a, a different game at the local game shop, Star Wars Unlimited, and my first round, I made all, like the worst plays back to back to back to back. <laughs> and the worst part was like my brain was sharp because I knew what the opponent was going to do. And then I did the thing that would allow them to do that. The Like it was like my brain was like playing on their side of the field. Like I was like, all right, they're playing vigilance. 10 bucks says they're going to do this and this on their next couple actions. So I should probably, uh, yeah, let's play this Vader alone, even though I know that they're going to like or flip my Vader, even though I'm guaranteed to get it killed by power of the dark side. But you know what? Let's just do it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> no, and like, Jordan. and then I did it and then I was immediately regretful. And then he was just like, uh, okay, pay three or four. And he's like, yeah, uh, sacrifice it, I guess. And I was like, no, and the only I, my hand I had catered at that point to like go off once Vader hit the field, and it was the worst feeling ever. And like, and I knew it. Or there's another time where similar similar card was my downfall, and I knew they were setting up for it. He killed an unassuming character to make my board empty. He hit an Ozel who had done basically nothing all game, and with his Vader who not on ambush like he could have attacked my base for five and you're like why would he kill a tapped ozzel and my brain immediately was like it's because he has uh, the removal where it has to be alone and he knows i'm about to play something because i have nine stuff and my brain was like let's play this this big nine cost ship anyway and then he's like boom power of the dark side you have nothing else on board. You got to so, destroy it. And I was like, so twice in a row, no. your opponent just, to, I'm trying to break it down. Cause our audience doesn't know star Wars limited. A lot of them. Yeah. Right. So, so your misplays remo- were, Oh, I was going to say the removal card in, in, in question that I knew my opponent had. And I knew my opponent was trying to use says that I get to choose something on my side of the field and it gets killed. So the you know what you normally do with that is you cater it so that your opponent only has one thing so they have to choose the one thing, and I knowing this used Vader and I forgot what the name of their starship is they both- but they're a really high cost really powerful game like yeah. potentially game ending cards and I knew that they had they were going to use it and I still casted those things as like my only action for the turn both so times you're just field. like empty board. I'm just going to put my biggest thing possible out there just so they can destroy it with just three mana. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, and like the worst part is yeah. the first time it happened, it was shame on the, you know, just shame on just in general, because he, I didn't know, no, he had it, but I had a hunch he had a removal. But the second time is the, with the Ozzel occurrence. And that I knew based on him attacking the Ozzel for no real reason that he had to have removal or a removal. And my brain was still like, Eh, just do it anyway and it was it was catastrophic and i had lost the next turn because of it i think it was bad i think actually you know and it's an interesting thing to bring up because i think that both altered and star wars unlimited we you know we talked a lot about them a, a number of episodes ago comparing them but both of those games are games where it is very easy to make a misplay and immediately know that you have completely screwed up um they're they're both games because of the back and forth actions uh and i feel like just you know other other games you kind of just like put a bunch of stuff on board and then like oh we'll just see what happens you know but i just feel like the punishment is so immediate in both of these games you're like i take my action your action oh yeah that completely destroys me this turn congratulations great job (laughs) it's like you know i feel that way about like i you know in altered i'll i'll play something out of hand and then they'll go, Oh, okay. I'll sabotage your Shenlong. And I'm like, Oh yeah, I guess I should have started with that instead. So you couldn't sabotage it. That would have been a good idea. Or, um, I, I mean, I, I, I guess I don't think I do that one too often. I have done it for sure. Uh, but the one that I do a lot is I will, I will play something too big too early where I like have like a, like a, maybe a removal option in my hand. Uh, and then another unit with some different stats or whatever. And I'll go, I'm just going to play this big thing that takes me off of being able to play the removal option instead of like a small thing that would have kept both of them live. And then my opponent goes, oh, cool. All right, well, then I'm going to play this thing that just like 
is totally destroys you on that side. And if you had a removal, you'd be fine, but you don't now. <laughs> so yeah, like it's, it's very easy to immediately know, Oh, I have screwed up and it can happen in both games. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, good times. <laughs> yeah. Good, good times. Good times screwing up in card games. That's what we, that's what we love. That's, you know, that's, but that's, it makes the wins feel that much better. Right. When, <laughs> true. True. Um, yeah. The main thing is it just blew my mind that like in both of those moments, I knew what the opponent's plan was and I still played yeah. into it exactly the way that benefited them the most. That, okay. That is me against, against Navenka and Blotch. I think I'm finally getting better, but every single time I swear in those, in those, like all the, all the previous gameplay videos I've done when I'm playing against Lyra and they're playing Navenka and Blotch every single time I will say out loud in the video, okay, I'll play this here. And then that beats them, and then they don't have any resources left, so we'll definitely take that side. And then everyone goes, okay, I'll use Navenka, put a boost okay. counter on it, yeah. I win. And I'm like, <laughs> it's on the card. Yeah. Like, I that know specific that- specific happened to me, too. Like, for some reason, my brain just blanks their character, even though it's such a painful yeah. ability. Yeah, and I know. I'm like, oh, I got this. I got him tied up everywhere, and they're like a boost counter. And I'm like... How did I forget you can boost counter here? Oh my god! <laughs> I don't know why I always screw it up too, but I th- I'm finally I think I'm finally getting better and remembering it. And I'll say that, and then you'll probably watch the video next week, and it'll be like I'll do it again or something. So <laughs> who knows? Yeah, All right. Well, well, should we dive into these uh, questions yes. from Shadow the Sixth? Let's dive into Shadow Six. This is a Mega Mailbag Shadow the Sixth Edition. Thank you, Shadow the Six, for sending in so many questions. Let's start right at the top. Question number one. What design space hasn't really been used yet in Altered that you are the most excited to see? Hmm. Jordan, what kind of design? Like, it's always tough to think about what design space you haven't seen explored yet. I already have things in the chamber because this is slightly similar to uh, our or not necessarily similar to the question itself, but we had an answer that divulged into something like this um, between me and you. But yep. things that I want to see, because they're already icons on the card, which means they're probably thinking about it, the reserve and the landmark amounts. Because every character in the first set on the card itself, it lists, you get two landmarks, you get two reserve, which hints at the fact that there's room for play there in the future. So I'm excited to see what they do with that. Um, and what kind of abilities they're going to spawn to kind of counterbalance either having more reserve or less reserve. Or I, I really like the 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 far fringes of stuff like that because like just the wild stuff you can come up with the extremes. So like I want to see a character that has zero reserve and see what kind of crazy ability it has born from the fact that you have to play without a central game mechanic at your disposal. Or same with the, I mean, the landmarks also are, would be cool to have zero, but it's less impactful because there's a handful of decks that you don't run landmarks in anyway. So those decks would be kind of unchanged, but the reserve not being there is going to affect everything. And I think that would be cool. Um, Or another type of ability um, that they, I could definitely see design space in is play with swapping mana cards in and out or like trading them out later in the game. So you could like, tuck late game cards in early and then later swap them out for the cheaper cards that you don't necessarily need to grab your bombs for late game. Um, There could be cool stuff related to that, that I could definitely see that would get really exciting. Sure. Sure. I I've got two answers for this as well that are going to be, I think a little, I don't think we've talked about some of these uh, too much in previous ones. Um, One of the first things I'm just excited to see is more types of permanence. Because we have the landmark as a subtype of permanent, but we haven't seen other types of permanence. I think landmarks are going to be the only permanence in set one, I believe. But uh, who knows after that, right? It could be there could be lots of different things entering the board. The cool thing about permanence, the, the, the neat thing is that they are permanent, right? So while we have a landmark zone, you could imagine the potential that they could have permanence that could go anywhere on the board and just exist there and they don't get swept up in the rest phase because they're permanent. They will stay in play. And, and you know, you, what if, what if you had a permanent that attached to your hero and gave them an additional ability or something, you know, like there's, 
there's cool options be sick. with the permanent type that I think I'm excited about. Um, and the other thing I would like to see is more play with our mana orbs. Um, I would like to see effects that let you like swap cards with your mana orbs um, or pick up cards that you've put down um, or, or just that use the mana orbs for potentially different purposes. We've already seen, we've seen a few like landmarks that have them as costs and everything. But um, one thing like just having, having a character that has like an activated ability that costs some amount of mana could be a really interesting way to shore up some of those turns where you're unable to spend all of your mana and get some extra benefits. Um, I, I, yeah, I just think, I think I would like to see more, more mana stuff and more permanent stuff are probably the, the two areas that I think there's a lot of very easy design space to explore. That could be very exciting. For sure. And then one last thing that I remembered before we, we, go to the next question is I'd like to see, I guess this is more a mechanical thing, but it's still technically in the design space uh, umbrella. Um, I want to see their take on mill effects since milling is not lethal in this game. It'd be very interesting to see the cool different types of effects they could do with milling either, you know, milling the enemy or milling yourself um, having some benefit or, you know, boon or debuff depending on like the cards that are milled or like some way to do something with it. And it would make it an interesting design space because of it not being lethal. Like it is in pretty much every other card game They could do all kinds of weird stuff. And it wouldn't be as stigmatized in this game because it's not going to kill you. And you're originally, you're eventually going to reshuffle your deck. So like the milling isn't like obscenely unfun, like it is in some games. Um, and it's, it could just be very interesting depending on like what they do with that mechanic since it's so unrestricted since it's not a, a win con. They, they could, could also cool stuff. If they wanted it to be a win con, they, there could also be a hero who has an ability that lets you like advance based on how much you've milled your opponent or something. Which would be Ooh, kind yeah. Of like he gets a counter and then for every card that's milled. And then once you reach a threshold, you can be like, you get to advance once, like a yeah. once per game. Like, and once you've milled 15 cards, you activate this ability as a quick action and you just get a free advance or something. Yeah. That would be cool. Yeah. Because that yeah. would also not outright make them lose the game, but it would give you this, you know, one time push forward, which would be For interesting. A, a different style of play. Yeah. Yeah. I think that'd be, that's a, that's a cool idea too. I like that. All right. Next up, how are you going to approach deck building for this game? So I'd say this is something we have touched on in some previous episodes, but I will say as I've been playing every every couple of weeks, I go through just a, playing a bunch on Exalted. Uh, by the way, Exalted has a ranked queue now, which is pretty cool. Um, it still uh, it still has um, a small number of players who are playing on Altered periodically, but every night I'm, there are people playing. Um, so I'm excited for more people. I'm saying this right now. I'm going to put the link for Exalted down in the description. Go download Exalted and start playing Rank Q so we can start getting more people in here. Um, you'll start at your cardboard rank and you rank up as you play against other people. And I'm I'm a wood rank now. Yes, so good. Go. Um, I, I need just, to I, did, I need to I play did, more. I did not know the the ranked was in it. I need to start playing more. I got to get that. Yep, that rank up. Got to get your rank up. Um, so yeah, as I've been playing more and more. Um, I have been changing kind of how I value certain things in certain factions, but a lot of the time, I think my deck building is still somewhat similar. Um, I usually have a pretty decent weight towards uh, lower cost cards. I find cards like Studious Disciple and stuff to be just, they pull their weight pretty well. Their That ability to, we talked about, we had a whole episode talking about one and two drops, but um the ability to to push off your your actions a little bit using them as sort of a, a cheap after you effect um, or the ability to sneak in with you have that one resource left whenever your opponent has one resource left you're never sure like do you have something do you not um, having that extra one thing to play can help you win a side or steal a side that's open um, so I you know I, I like having a little bit higher count of one and two drops which is something I found was a problem with the Iraq and Kibble deck which is that 
I've had to wait towards higher cost things just so I have a better chance of flipping anything useful off of a rock and kibble ever. Um, Cause yeah, I flipped studious disciple. Doesn't feel good. It's not, it's not a good uh, hero ability when you do that. Um, and then otherwise I try to put in some amount of uh, removal. Um, some factions more than others. Uh, Izmir and Lyra, I find Lyra having control effects, having removal, I find really important because Lyra has so little control over the rest of their life. That ha- I need to have options. I, I I like to run Paint Prism and I r- like to run Out of Faction Off You Go in Lyra. Both essential. I've been playing a little bit of acapella training too, which has been actually pretty sick sometimes. So um, I'd say some of my biggest changes in deck building have been running some cards that I thought weren't as good right away, like acapella training. I, I totally underrated that. And, um, and also just like pushing even deeper into some early drops in a lot of games as well. Um, and then I, I start with rares and I, I see what rares do I think are most important, which commons do I think I'm fine with the common version of, and I build out the deck kind of from there, I guess that's the most generic way I can put it. How about, how about you, Jordan? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm approaching it the same way that I approach basically every game, which is, this is going to sound a little bit more on the generic end, but it's, it's how I do it in my own headspace. I start with just the general idea of what I want the deck to do. I'll search, basically do like a keyword search, if you will, for all the cards in the game that will have that effect. And then I will narrow it down to whatever faction I'm playing. And then I will just kind of take a look at it. I'll identify the cards that I consider like key to whatever strategy that I want it to do. Throw those in at three of. And then I'll have some general good stuff in there, especially with one set. Um, there's not a ton of options in set one. Um, half a set games. right now, if you're building oh, yeah. right now. Half a set. I meant like if, once the game comes out, I'll be approaching yeah. this way because set one will, be, it'll be bigger, but it won't be like blown my mind expansive. Uh, but I'll, I'll, that'll be the basically the starting ground. And then I do something that a lot, a lot of people do. I'm okay with having a bad deck to make a better deck later. So I will put a lot of, and Dan's probably going to laugh because he know, he's seen me do this a lot of times. I'm a big fan of putting one to two ofs of a bunch of different yeah. cards in the deck, playing it a handful of times first, because then it's way better to, in my opinion, to identify the cards that are truly pulling their weight and the ones that are cards you never play or the second you see them, you're like, oh, I wanted literally any other card other than this. Um, so when you play the one or two ofs, it gives you it casts a wider net, so you'll be able to identify the cards that are important and do work with your strategy versus the cards that aren't really doing much or cards that are found in niche or like maybe a silver bullet, so you can think of them for side deck stuff later. And then I'll go through like two to five drafts of that deck, doing that same process where I'll start with a bunch of I'll have the core and then a bunch of one and two draw or not drops, but a bunch of one and two ofs to kind of test the waters of what works, what doesn't. And then the second draft, you know, I'll, I'll remove the ones I know doesn't work. I'll replace them with cards that I'd like to see more often. And then I'll do it again and further refine. And I'll do that three or four times until I get a good, nicely, finely tuned deck. But yeah, the first uh, handful of outings of that deck, I just I just take the bullet and I'm like, I know this is going to be a bad deck the first couple times I play it. But it really helps me see it. And it helps me for future deck building as well, because then in the future, I'll be like, oh, I remember this card totally sucked in this deck, but I remember it really helped me out doing this thing. And this new deck is going to do that thing so I can put it in here and I know it'll do well. Sure. There's there's something to be said about just getting a good breadth of experience with a lot of different decks as well. Um, definitely can help your deck building be more efficient in the future. But yeah, main deck Taylor always, what's the what's the term he uses all the time? Um, there's a term he has when he sees that I have a bunch of random one ofs. And I, I don't forgot what it is. There's a lot of oh. fun Taylor terms that he. Has. I, I I I can't think of what term <laughs> he would use is. for that, but yeah. But I know there's 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 something he uses all the time when he like sees my deck list and he's like, "What are all these?" Insert Taylorism here. <laughs> I I would just uh, I mean I would just call them bad cards a lot of the time. We'll look at your <gasps> list and be like, "There's a bunch of one of like those aren't even good cards. Like why are you putting those in?" <laughs> How uh, dare. Yeah, well, well, you know what? You've got me. You've like, 
you've got me before with like I thought a card was bad and you started playing like oh wait a second that card is not as bad as I thought <laughs> so it's fair that's fair but yeah uh, yeah. But yeah, that's probably about as much as we can really say right now, because it's really going to come down to your faction and your heroes and, and a lot of stuff or anything a little more deeply. Yeah. But that's kind of how both of us, I'd say combined approach, that'll get you a pretty solid deck. For sure, for sure. All Next right. question. Is, yeah, go uh, for it. Now that we know more about what's in a pack, what's your guess for how much a foiler will be worth? So. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, Alex's question. That's a hard question to answer right now. It's the the price of foilers is going to very much depend on the uh, it's such a stupid thing to say the demand for foilers. I mean, how how are we supposed to? I don't know if we can just come up off the top of our head with a price. I can say like looking at other card games, um, common foils typically aren't worth a ton. Um, it depends on how rare they end up being like in in grand archive foils are are pretty rare you only get three per box and that's of all types of foils it's it's, it's even common foils can be worth five to fifteen dollars just depending on the card um but in other games like magic the gathering a common foil is worth sometimes less than the non-foil f- version of the card for some reason um because they're yeah they have the collector packs where every pack you're getting like seven common foils in them and people crack those open because that's where they put the really rare drops and so they flood the market with them. Um, I think common foilers are because of the Kickstarter editions, the buffs that it got in the Kickstarter. Big I think there's going to be floating around quite a bit. Um, I don't think you're going to pay very much for common foilers. You know, I would I wouldn't be surprised they were a, a buck or a few bucks or something uh yeah. or even or uncommon heroes foils i or don't something. think it's gonna be that big yeah uncommon foils uh are or sorry, or rare, sorry there's no there's uncommon, no uncommons rare. yes rare foils rare foils i was about to get you on it rare foils are um yeah i mean rare foils will certainly be a little more and the the big thing for that is that well i can't actually i'm, I'm blanking on this now if you rare foil a card that's only going to affect like that's not going to affect the faction shifted version of the card or vice versa, right? It'll just be yeah. whichever. Yeah. So, so if you so for every card that you want to run, I mean, there's just there's going to be a lot of rares, and you might, I don't know, they're going to be a lower drop rate anyway. So rare foils are probably worth a little bit more. I would imagine. I would say they'd be a little bit more too, just because their drop rates lower, and there's double the amount of rares that there is commons. Yeah. So the amount of people that want to foil stuff out are going to have to have a lot more leg room to foil that out. And for like foiling your deck, you're going to need more common foilers than rare foilers, obviously, because you will likely need no more than five rare foilers for a lot of decks that you build. Um, But for commons, you're going to need at least uh, nine, eight, eight, eight. (laughs) <laughs> eight i can do math um but but just given how much more rare common foilers are or how much more common common foilers are i think they'll be not too bad and yeah once you like you said once you foil one common then that covers it for every deck that you put that common in whereas like you may a rare foiler you may only want for one deck in the world is the only deck where you want to play faction shifted all in or something um bravos all in like yeah i found the deck for it perfect then you that you just need that foil for that one thing. Um, and then you're going to need to get more for other decks. So unique foilers are going to be expensive. I think um, those are going to, oh. those are going to be pretty decent because everybody's going to want to, I think you're going to want to not everybody. Cause people, some people don't like foils, but if you like foils at all, you're going to want to foil your uniques because you want it to feel as good as possible when you see the uniques. I think that's my thought, right? At least how do you feel about that? I think the uniques are going to be quite a bit more than the other ones because their drop rate is considerably less, um, even in the Kickstarter edition, compared to the rare and, of course, the common. And those are one-time use. And by that, I mean I mean they're all one-time use, but in the common thing, you're going to reprint and use that a bunch of times. The unique is going to be unique enough where there's probably only one or two decks that you're ever going to use that in. There's only one copy of that. So even if you have the same 
uh, you know, character or three different uniques of that character, you need to get three different foils of it because they are unique cards. They are different. So not only are they going to be exceedingly much more rare to acquire, but when somebody does acquire it and they use it, it's only used on that one card ever. There's no, I can do it on a rare and just print 30 rare foils of that rare one because there's only the one unique. You got to have one for every unique you have. So I think that's going to be the real, uh, the real, uh, bar- not bargain, uh, price, price point there is going to be the uniques. I think the rares will have decent enough value. Commons, like you said, will probably be very easy to come by. Uh, but the uniques are going to be where you might spend a pretty penny on it, depending on the demand for it. And I'm assuming the demand will be fairly high, given, like you said, you want that, like when you want, when you see that card, you want it to be Mega Pog edition, not lame unfoiled edition. Yeah. And they, I mean, we do have the gold packs that'll give you a few unique foilers as well as a bunch of uniques. Like those are, those are going to be really sick whenever you open them. And those are going to add a, like a little bit of unique foilers to the market. But I, I don't think, I think, I think they're going to be pretty hot. I mean, but I don't think it's going to be crazy. Like, I don't think you're, you're paying 50 bucks for a unique foiler or anything. Oh yeah, unless the game takes off. So maybe we do want it to be 50 bucks. I mean, that sure. means everyone's clamoring to get them. Sure. But yeah, I'd say I wouldn't be surprised if they make it as high as maybe $20 when the when like at the height of the opening box hype. Yeah, you and but, I are about on the same page then. I was like I was thinking like a few bucks for common, maybe like 5ish at max for a rare foil and 10 to 20 maybe for a unique foiler depending you know on just how popular things are it was like maybe the maybe the area i was i was thinking i do want to show everyone for for our visual audience there this is my unique foiler (laughs) (laughs) i i got this in the draft that i did uh the community event in paris um it's i i held my finger over the qr code but it doesn't matter it's not actually a this is not a live foiler it doesn't do anything, but they when they put out these draft packs together, they did. They even put the tokens in them, um, even though they didn't do, didn't do anything. And I saw this in my pack and was like, "Yeah, I'm keeping this. I want my unique foiler. <laughs> I'm gonna foil up my unique with it." There were no uniques in the packs, though. Only uh, unique foilers. So, what can you do? Um, yeah. Okay. That that answers that pretty well, I think. Yep. Uh, okay. Next, Shadow the Sixth asked, what character are you most excited to see as a unique? Oh, man, Jordan, I was thinking about this. I've got a few answers. Um, I, I will start by just saying the character I'm most excited to see as unique I, has not been revealed yet. <gasps> secret character yeah I, there's one that i think is really really cool and i'm really curious to see how um how they do unique versions of it uh but a character that i am very excited to see unique versions of is and i was talking about him earlier but shenlong um because big dragon is cool look i'm a simple guy i see a big dragon i think it's cool and big unique dragons, especially because Shenlong has a unique artwork in the Kickstarter as well. I don't I have no idea what he could do, but I can just imagine tons of like really cool, like bomb dragons to flip. And if you're playing this, like if well, if you have a no unique one will always be Bravo. So you're not going to get to put it in your rock and kibble deck, sadly. But um, in your Bravos deck, you can have all sorts of cool Shenlongs to end the game with with cool abilities and that just sounds like a lot of fun like you never know which shenlong you're gonna have to deal with this game (laughs) right so um how about you you got any characters that spring to mind for you i do know of one that i am really excited about which is atlas Uh, oh that was another one i was gonna say gigantic with crazy stat line and some other random boost oh it's oh imagine the possibilities of something that has the ability to affect both sides of the board and then maybe it'll have a gigantic style ability that also like does something to the rest of the stuff on both sides or you know hampers the opponent in some way or even one that just has something as simple as uh what's the oh no i forgot the keyword basically the blocker keyword sentinel or uh, def- something uh, that where they defender. can't cause you to, what is it 
Defender. Defender. Okay. Imagine if it had Defender and it had double the stats. Just you, yeah. a turn you know that you aren't going to win either just, side. You're just like, oh, well, I'll just drop this. I wasn't going to win anyway. Now you're not winning either. Yeah, Sick. yeah. Not, absolutely can't <laughs> win. Yeah, I like that a lot. Buys you a whole nother turn to get whatever you need. Oh. I'm going to put one more out here because I have to put a little love towards I, I'm I'm pretty confident I'm settled into Muna is Muna is where I'm at. I just love Muna's cards too much. Um, and I'm going to throw love out to this card that got spoiled a little later. It wasn't one of the ones we had uh, with the like full starter deck reveals. It's Dracaena. Dracaena is naturally a three, three, uh, th- I'm, I'm still, I think we still need to work on how we're audio in audio terms saying how reading out cards. Dracaena is a three mana from hand, three mana from reserve, zero, two, two dragon plant, which first of all, come on, that's just cool. I love, I like, I love a good plant dragon. I'm a fan. And Dracaena has when played from anywhere, I gain anchored. And at noon, I gain one boost. And uh, the rare version is a 0-1-1, but has at noon, I gain two boosts. And the reason I'm excited about this card is, well, number one, it's just co- it's cool. That's a cool card. I like It's like Sneezer Shroom, uh, but can go a little wilder if you can chain anchors on that rare version. Ooh, that's fun. But I can imagine some cool versions of this unique card where at noon, he just does something that like... It, could, it does not have to be Dracaena gains the boost. It can be at noon, you resupply. At noon, you draw a card. At noon, you uh, give boost to something else. At noon, you give something fleeting or like whatever. I, well, that just seems, that wouldn't be very good. It would only hit anchor things, but whatever. Like, who cares? I'm just saying that I see a card like this. I think this is a, this could be a cool utility card that can sit out there for multiple turns and fuel things in interesting ways. And I just, I'm excited to see what kinds of versions of this card can exist. That The most exciting thing to, to me about Altered is how there's just going to be cards I've never seen before. I can't even dream of them. So I just get pumped. And every time we start talking about these, like, I need to see uniques right now. I need to see them. I'm so pumped for them. As am I. I'm. I'm. I. I ever. I want them to come out. I just want to open cards. I want to know. It kills me that we've only seen the one, and the possibilities in my mind are like near endless. It's like I yeah. just want to know. Like even just if they spoiled like five of them, just to start, just to be like, here's a little bit more than just the one. Here's going to be five that you may be able to find in the opening packs. Yep. Of the first day, like. I, I would be so hype if we had just a, a unique, a flood of, of just a few unique foilers one day, foilers, unique cards one day, just to like, just get all our minds racing about all the possibilities. But uh, yeah, I mean, we'll see soon enough, I'm sure. Either way. True, true. Okay, next question. Jordan, why don't you read this one out? Okay. What keyword do you think will be the strongest? the strongest keyword so what keywords do we have we have we have anchored uh which we will keep gigantic. something in play we have gigantic which counts on both sides counts as stats on both sides we have fleeting mm-hmm. that's not the strong well it's not the strongest one on your things <laughs> <laughs> it's can be quite good to have on your opponent's things but i don't know if it's the strongest um we have sabotage resupply sabotage and resupply yep our ways of messing with reserve we have sleep uh, oh, yeah, sleep. Sleep, sleep, sleep can be pretty good. Sleep can be really sleep good. Very good. Um, if used properly, anyway. Yes. We have Tough. Tough got me in a game the other day. I did the thing where they played. The, I didn't realize it was rare Shenlong that they played on Exalted. I thought oh, it was no. just common Shenlong. And I went to Paint Prison it. And I did not have enough mana. And I had to Paint Prison something else. Actually, I think I. I I think I had to either pick my own thing or nothing or something, and I just like picked nothing. <laughs> like it was a bad turn. It didn't go well. Um, tough is tough is very good too. Um, do we have any other? Just off the top of our heads, we're trying to think of other I, keywords. I feel like there's one more that I feel I, like we're forgetting something. Not. Yeah. Someone out there is currently like yelling at 
That's their phone name. or something. I mean, defender is a keyword. We just talked about that one. Um, but I, that's not really going to be in the running for strongest keyword because on its own, it's not strong. It just is usually on stuff that is strong in strong. other ways. Oh, after you, after you. Oh yeah. After you, Apparently, it's after you, it's after you, Yeah, after you is the strongest keyword. I'm straight up, right? How could it be something else? Do you really think it, do you really, Jordan, you really think something else is stronger than after you? Kind of, yeah, because after you, don't get me wrong, I love after you, it is very strong and very potent, but after you doesn't necessarily win you, like it gives you some more information, but there's a lot of times where you're like after you, and then the opponent plays something and you're like, I literally couldn't stop that if I wanted to, and after you in that instance did absolutely nothing for you, but show you your doom. Um, The one I was going to say that comes in the running, there's only one example of it, um, is Gigantic. Because it lets you do both sides with one action and gives you a venue to potentially control and attack both sides. And we've only seen it on one card so far. But having it be on other cards that could do stuff or other cards that have easily boostable stats or just like a Shenlong stat. Oh, he has secret tech that no one this else card, knows about. This card has gigantic on it. I will say that. I will not show you the other side. Wait, can I, maybe I can, can I, can I show one thing here? Okay, I can do this. For, for our audience, I will, I will say it out loud as well. But all I can do is slip this onto the camera. Oh, uh, it's purple. It's purple. Okay, so there was a very blurry Izmir icon. Okay, so that's all, that's all I'm going to say. That little teaser. A little te- fleeting thoughts teaser, but yeah, there are more cards with Gigantic. Um, gigantic is really good. I mean, Gigantic it ha- is is so good that the cards with Gigantic have to be costed like very appropriately to fit it on. Mm-hmm. Um, my big thing about Gigantic and also effects like Anchored and everything that are also quite good is that removal is just so available. Um in many factions, including things like sleeping the gigantic unit too, where it, it is, it feels easier to deal with something that has gigantic, especially with gigantic. Cause you pay so much in for it that when your opponent goes cool paint prison, then you go, all right, well you win both sides this turn. Congrats. <laughs> like it's, um, it can be tough to keep up with. Where you're right, after you sometimes doesn't actually give you that much benefit, but I would say other times it's the difference, like by far between winning and losing the round because your opponent commits something somewhere and then you're just like, okay, perfect. Like I was going to commit on the wrong side. Now I can commit over here or now I can blow you out entirely and end up winning both sides because I, I knew what you were spending all your mana on this turn or whatever. It's just like... I think a lot of long-term TCG players often will resort to information is the um, is the most valuable resource you can have. And I feel like, I mean, that's this is exactly what I'm talking about. I want information. I want to know what you're playing. I want to, I like I like to do things at the last possible moment as a as a you know experienced Magic player and being able to do everything after I've seen what you're doing in altered is just other than when you need to like sabotage something before they play it after you is usually super good. Yeah, for sure. Another reason I was a little hesitant to use after you is because it's technically a keyword, but so far we've only seen it on a character and I don't know if it's not true. Is it? It's it's on, it's the uh, ability on Alice, the reserve ability on Alice. Um, or support ability is the right term. Oh my god, I forgot about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think there's another okay, never card mind too. Then. Just kidding, throwing it out. All right, Pretend I all right, good, Pretend good. Then nothing. we're all on the same page. After you is the strongest. It has the potential to be <laughs> maybe the strongest. Okay, all right. I'll, that's about as much as I can get from tied. Jordan. That's They're a tied. That's okay. Mind. A tie. A tie is by far the best I've ever gotten to Jordan. Gotten Jordan to in a debate. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll count that as a win. <laughs> All right. Um, so we have tied after you and 
gigantic, although we all know that after you is the winner. So excellent answer. Next question. Uh, what is one thing that you were concerned Altered will do wrong, but only time will show? This is a great question. AKA one reason not to back another TCG on Kickstarter. Um, so like, I, I think with that second part, they meant like something that if Alter does it wrong, it would make, it would put you off of backing another TCG on Kickstarter or something. Is that what he's saying? I'm th- I read it more so like, what's an example? Like if it was completely wrong, that would be like a cautionary tale to other people to be like, Hey, okay. you're, this game looks hype, but make sure X, Y, and Z. Cause it might be bad. Sure. Kind of deal. As the sure. way I, I understood it anyway. Okay. Well, I follow a lot of Kickstarter TCG. I follow a lot of, I mean, I follow a lot of TCGs in general. Um, and I follow Kickstarter ones and I like to see what they're doing. Um, I have things that I'm not concerned all to do wrong. That would be a massive, massive red flags. <laughs> you know, they could say we've uh, kicked out all our artists and are going purely AI art or something, right? If they did that, that would be a huge, huge, huge mistake. And I would completely drop all my support. Um, thankfully they're not doing that. So that's not something we have to worry about. Um, things that they could, that I'm concerned they'll do wrong. I'm not, I'm not concerned about a lot to be fair. Um, I have been given a lot of reason to be optimistic about what the company is doing, but, um, I guess if I had to pick something, it would maybe be, maybe I'd be concerned that they won't necessarily develop the game in future sets in ways that uh, keep people interested, I guess. That's maybe like one of the most realistic concerns I think I could have right now, just because we don't really know what's coming in the future. Um, we don't know how future sets are going to look like what kinds of how, what their size is going to be, how much they're going to shake up the core play styles of the game. Like, are they going to have more heroes? Or are they not going to have more heroes? There's a lot of stuff we can assume, but, um, I would say that's one of the areas where just our, I guess, because our information is the least, that's where I just, I, you know, I, all I can do is sit here and go, well, okay. Set one looks really cool. Like obviously finding tons of fun ways to play the game here. Now, what's the follow through going to be like? What's set two going to look like? What's set three going to look like? How are those sets going to continue to keep people excited? Because, you know, in set one, if you find the three best uniques for your deck and you have a deck that's really good, what is going to make you in set two want to pick up set two? you know, and, 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 and start building new things. Cause maybe are, do you have to hunt down three more good uniques from set two to play your deck or are, are any of the cards in set two even going to make it in your deck? And, and there, I think there's, you know, stuff's up in the air. They have to, I hope they follow through well with it, with very solid design and development to make the sets exciting and, and approachable for people and make people want to buy them. But that's, I guess, I think that's one of the areas where I, I just, I just hope it works out. My concern, um, again, it's a very light concern, is that they don't follow through with keeping hype up and or their, what's the word I'm looking for? There's a specific word, their promotion of the game. Um, Because they did a fantastic job leading up to the Kickstarter. During the Kickstarter, it was fantastic. There was the roadshows going on constantly. People in the area that went to roadshows Uh, When I went to other card events at the card shop, people were still talking about Altered. But as time has gone on, I've heard less and less about Altered outside of the like emails specifically towards me because I backed the game. Sure. And I haven't seen a lot of like buzz at game stores. There hasn't been a lot of like commercials, if you will, because like even during like during the Kickstarter, I was getting propositioned like the different. uh, banner ads and stuff towards altered and since the kickstarters ended i haven't seen much of that elsewhere and i'm worried that the game's hype is going to deflate by the time the game comes out but what i'm hoping for is you know a month before the game comes out or like a month before gen con now that release is actually around the corner they'll pick that up again and i do trust that they probably will 
Um, but it, I don't know. The, you know. That would be one thing that would be bad is if they're all hype, getting in everyone's faces, like at our great game. It's so great doing road shows. And then now that the Kickstarter ended, it's almost like unless you're with your ear to the ground, like in the news outlets or looking for the news, I haven't seen it pushed elsewhere now that the Kickstarter is ended. And it's a, it's a little disheartening, but I also get uh, trying to keep up a hype train for seven months while your game has right. nothing out there. Doesn't make sense. But like I said, I'm going to be more than happy as long as like a month before release or like, you know, a week or two before Gen Con where they're probably going to have a big presence uh, that they start, you know, posting to the greater public and to be like, hey, the game is right around the corner now. Time to get on the hype train again, because that would deflate the game no matter how great your game is or how good your product is. If no one's playing your card game and no one knows about your card game, it might as well just not exist. Like, yep. We, we right now we're in that sort of that post Kickstarter lull that happens with every Kickstarter TCG as well. Um, not that many Kickstarter TCGs have really done great after Kickstarter. A lot of them are struggling or have died already. Um, Grand Archive is doing great though. That's, that's one that I'm, I'm proud of, but, um, altered, you know, is going to be no exception from some of the same rules, which is like after the Kickstarter happens, yeah, I, I, I watch our YouTube video stats. Like I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not just with my head in the sand right now. Like I, I know that right now the general interest in the game is lower, obviously than it was during the Kickstarter, but you don't expect it to be the same or higher. That was the hype period. Um, this is the lull period, but you're totally right. I want to see them get back to, um, to getting to push the game, but it has to be at a good time because at the end of the day, you think about Equinox has a marketing budget and it has, it's a budget. It's not an infinite pool of money and you need to get the most back, the most return back for the amount you spend on your marketing. And I think just right now isn't really the time to be spending a lot on marketing. Uh, you're cause getting people in now is just going to make them forget time. about the game before, yeah. <laughs> before it comes out. Um, uh, so we have to wait a little bit and see where this hat, where they start to push it. Cause they're doing the right things. You know, they like, they, they had a good presence at gamma, um, which is a big, uh, retailer and, and store owner focused, um, convention that happens, uh, every year in the States. Um, they had a presence there and I heard good things about all the demos they were running there. Um, and I believe they're still showing up at just, you know, various cons just with their boots and, and showing the game off and everything. Uh, but, there's no point right now in pushing a ton of like, like you said, commercials, like, like YouTube ads and everything like that. Um, but in a few months there will be, it will be the time. And um, I definitely hope to see things start to ramp up as we get closer to that. For sure. Uh, the next question, Jordan, I don't think we need to answer. What would be the best yep. deluxe component that could be in the Kickstarter? We've, uh, so this got asked a long time ago, uh, which is why we're just making sure to answer all these now. And uh, we already saw all the best deluxe components. They were great. So I personally liked the big carrying case with everything. I was a little sad that it doesn't fit the way I want it to, but it still fits everything you need. Yeah, I was hoping the compartment would have been big enough to fit the deck wallet into the big storage case. Yeah, so that's right. I remember you telling storage. me that like you want to put boxes and boxes and boxes. I yeah. hope they make a carrying case that holds two of those carrying cases. <laughs> yeah. So we'll uh, skip right along to the next question then. If you could create a character, what would its effect be? This could be this could be anything. Um, boy. Uh, no, hold on. I have one. I have one. Uh, I want a character that has discard a card from your reserve exhaust and discard a card from your reserve as a quick action to sabotage that'd be so nasty oh I my want, god just give me that disgusting control character please give me that i yep that sounds really fun to me like yeah you don't know no, you're not one card each turn you are not going to get to play a second time and that can really mess up your opponent pretty well. So that's oh, that's man. my character. 
probably Knowing the ever-present sabotage is there. Oh. Yeah, it's, for me, it's probably um, I think, but oh well. I'm a big fan of weird and alternate uses for the same type of cards. So maybe um, if I if I one idea we had is the mill idea from before. I think that would be a cool effect. Yeah, having some sort of mill and then a pseudo alternate win con. But if I can't use that one, I would say some other thing that would trans transform an effect of something else to do something else for example a axiom character that's based off of landmarks but its effect can do something else so for example it'll blank the landmark and the landmark instead provides a boost based on its cost to stuff oh, okay. each turn so like like transmuting your landmarks into other types yeah of effects. so like you you change a landmarks effect you blank its current effect and it gets a new effect that's like at noon give a character a boost for you know every two mana this thing costs because then it'll do something ongoing every single time you have it or maybe not at noon because that have it be at dusk it bo- think, gives two boosts to something or one boost or something or the the super cool thing about altered is that like that character thematically could be like uh Midas. oh my i was i was thinking about like the whole philosopher's stone legend oh, that which could work too. right like which would be a real thing probably in altered you know like and and that could be the the character who um they 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 you know imagined the philosopher's stone and altered the world with it and now they're using it and they, they're in axiom because they're all about um you know the science behind it and everything and that yeah i don't know that that could be a really cool character thematically yeah, um, mine was Midas because he'd touch it, turn it to gold. And yeah. gold, as we know, is one of the best, if not the best conductor. So he's like sure. converting its components to be better conductors, which is why he can boost other stuff. And he can make golden brass bugs. <laughs> exactly. Oh, that'd be sick. <laughs> and uh, my character is just a jerk, just an absolute <laughs> terrible person, a total bully. So, uh, but, you know, I'd have so much fun playing them. <laughs> sorry <laughs> fun is sometimes zero sum unfortunately but <laughs> you know it works out uh okay is there an effect you don't want to see an altered and immediately the entire audience is saying dan's <laughs> character idea i don't want to see that <laughs> all right fair enough fair enough um they said discarding or location manipulation etc um i can I just say no? Is that a lame cop out excuse? I want to see all kinds of effects. I want to see everything. Altered is a fun game. It's got lots and lots of room for exploration. I can't think of anything that I don't want to see in the game. I, but I'm not like I know there there are people out there who are like I hate mill. I hate mill. I hate discard. I hate you know land destruction and magic or whatever. And that's fine. Like you know everyone's got their preferences. That's cool. I'm I've never been that way. I just as long as it's balanced enough, bring it on. Let's go. Yeah, it's going to be kind of a cop-up, but I was going to say something similar. Uh, knowing me, I like off-the-wall builds, and the more diverse effects are in a game, the more chances there are to have a viable, off-the-wall, wacky rogue deck. And I live for random decks where I'm like, this deck is going to do the dumbest combo ever, but it's going to somehow fit together perfectly, and it's going to go great. And my opponent's going to sit down, they're going to be confused until the last piece of the puzzle hits the board, then they're going to be like, oh my god, this is sick! <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've heard about i've seen plenty of your decks like that in fact and, and heard about more of them um yeah i mean like i think you know i want to see uh i would be fine with discard i would be fine with alternate win cons i would be fine with mana orb destruction probably a lot of people don't want that i bet but uh, as again as if it's balanced i'm fine with it i think at the end of the day like this is a game that has a resource system so if the cost things appropriately, then I'm good that I'm happy with it. That's, yeah, as long that's, as that's the main shtick is as long as they're costed appropriately and the effect is balanced to what it does. I feel like any co- any effect is fair game. I think part of the reason people have like a bad taste in their mouth with certain stuff is in some games back in their early stages, they had effects that did things like discard land destruction, but they were, you know, for the time, they probably thought it was a fine cost, but after people got it in their hands, it was Omega busted and very unfun to be like, oh, you'd blow up all my land for four mana. That's cool. 
Oh, well, that's fair. Yeah, Armageddon <laughs> is cool. <laughs> or a, discard the cards, and then you have an enchantment that makes you just dis- take damage when I discard, so I do nothing on my turn and lose health for it. That's fair. Oh yeah, let's go. These are some classic, <laughs> classic salty magic decks that I'm a huge fan of. Also, for I feel sure, like people sure. are learning a lot of the wrong things about me right now. Um, <laughs> and and the, and they're like, and Dan says he's a Muna player. <laughs> <laughs> over here being like i want you to be miserable <laughs> no i really do like Muna too i i like all kinds that's that's the thing about me i just i you should know that about me i i play so many card games i love all sorts of card games and all sorts of effects all right. what's the next one jordan the next one is going to be do you think there will be cards that will help defend against the sabotage keyword and i short answer Yes, I feel like it's definitely going to have some some play with it at some point. I could easily see a keyword being thrown in there that's just like um like unbreakable or something where like it's not able to be targeted by s- sabotage ability. Yeah. Things like that. Um it's it's something I could easily see on there and just like with our previous discussion as long as it's costed appropriately and added, I can definitely see it being a welcome addition. I think this would be such a cool whatever when they start to add new heroes this would be such an interesting hero that has like a keyword. Like they add a keyword that, that can be on cards. That's like, you know, shielded or whatever, like he's unbreakable, whatever. That's like this, just this can't be sabotaged. And then you could have a hero whose whole ability is, uh, your reserve, your all cards in your reserve have unbreakable. The worst part is the second you started the sentence, I my in my brain, I was like, that could be one of the dudes where their stat is they have one reserve, but the reserve can never be sabotaged. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that way they have less reserve overall, but they have the guarantee whatever is there can be played. This is the kind of thing that like I could see this, you know, obviously showing up in all factions in some amounts, but like one faction could certainly take this as part of their identity, too, and just be like, well, you know, maybe that's Muna's maybe that's Muna's new thing is like Muna Muna is resilient and just can't you know, have more cards that just can't be sabotaged, um, which would work really well with called. What's that? It could be called preservation. Oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. They can, they, all their cards are preserved, so you can't mess with them. And, and that works really nicely with Muna already having like some effects that work great with reserve and, and adding cards to reserve resupplying. I um, can see it being an Ortis as well. Cause it could be like a, a, a law thing. Like it could be a law that's yeah. enacted, like a landmark that's put into play that just says your cards can't be sabotaged. Yeah, yeah, I could see that, like, if, if maybe not a core part of their identity, but definitely having, like, a bureaucrat that just comes down and, and like, says... Uh, We're you, cracking you know, down on, on ne'er-do-wells. Yeah, Global exactly, sabotage. the law. The long arm of the law. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, yeah, that that that's cool. I do expect there to be something like that at some point, um, for sure. I think that would be a really great design space to explore. All right, and our final question from Shadow the Sixth. Dan and Jordan, what's your thoughts about introducing location cards with effects for side events at confluences? So we're talking about the the um, tumult cards in the center, I believe. But instead of just having our nice little array of the different permutations of the the region types, they have effects written on them. Like when your hero is here, this you know some something you're. Whatever your your units in this expedition get minus one stats or something or plus one stats or you draw an extra card or you know all sorts of stuff like that I, I can imagine. Um, that sounds fun. That sounds fun as heck. Like let's go. Like I altered is just a fun game to play. It's a game that I think is a good fun experience for people to play on a casual level as well as getting into it competitively. And I I think it would be a waste to not manipulate that central board, that unique part of the game um, in in alternate formats. So I'm all for it. How about you, Jordan? I am 100% for it. I love wacky side events and side events that do wacky things. I think this would be an excellent addition to side events. And to some extension, I could even see things like that happening in the main game. However, they would have to be more generic effects and they would have to be released as a set because in order to balance the game, like certain things need to appear. So all decks have an equal shot at potentially winning, but I could easily see them having like 
a special set of them that's the same you know locations but each one has some some caveat on it or special things so that way it's generic it'll apply to everyone and every location will still be represented um but as far as side event yeah go wild they can do all kinds of wild stuff they can have like a format that's just like oops all mountain or something like that (laughs) the mountain climbing format let's go (laughs) bring your best mountain climbers (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and it doesn't necessarily have to be only mountains, but like every every piece will have mountain as part of it, no matter what. Or like you said, like nah, just, when your just hero is mountain. here, the whole when your way hero down. is here, something will happen. Or when your companion reaches this level, something happens. Um, I could definitely see that having a lot of cool flavor, especially when you mix in the multiplayer version. We're like a bunch of people are running down different lanes and different stuff is happening to different people. Oh, yeah, that, could so, get, that could get wild. That'd be wacky and crazy. That'd be fun. I mean, like, Magic has a side format, a casual format called Plane Chase that adds these location cards that flip uh, flip up and they, they're constant effects while they didn't play and then you roll this die every turn and when it hits a certain side, then a, a, this crazy effect happens depending on what plane you're on. Um, and we, with the board just kind of built in, you could easily have, like, wacky formats like that too where you just have more effects that, that play out randomly and, like, you know, you'll, you'll flip to... You could have a stack of location cards. You have a format where your stack of location cards is like 50 location cards in it, and you just shuffle it and put three out um, each game. And so you just get... It's not balanced, right? But it's a side event. It's it's just it's wild. It's more fun. So, yeah. yeah, wacky, random fun like that. Same, Plane Chase is also not balanced. It's just for fun. <laughs> um, yeah, I definitely hope to see some fun stuff like that. Be, uh, it's like, All right. It's going to be great. Future I looks, think looks exciting. Yes, I think that's that's Shadow the Six questions. I think we got through all of them. Shadow the Six. I hope that was everything you were hoping for and more. Um, as a reminder to our audience, if you want to send questions for our mailbag, you certainly can. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning, but just hashtag mailbag and leave a comment on the YouTube video or main deck games at gmail.com with subject fleeting thoughts mailbag let us know what you want us to talk about in future episodes we we have a i think we have a pretty good plan for our future episodes right now but we are still looking for additional we have a, we we have some questions still in the mailbag but we could love we, we could love we would love and we could love to have more questions filling it up so that every episode we're able to answer two or three questions in addition to our other topics we're going to be filling out for you guys so um, feel free send them in would really appreciate it love to answer your questions as we go um, Jordan why don't you ooh Jordan's tired Jordan's <laughs> get tired get he's me. yawning Jordan why don't you get us out of here so you can go have a little nap a little beauty sleep a little for snoozy you. snooze but yeah uh, thank you all for watching as the day comes to a close those were our fleeting thoughts we hope to see you guys in two weeks for the next one Bye, everyone. Bye.